Very good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us a professional psychologist. And a very unique thing is this is the first time we are having direct sign language interpretation. The title for today's sharing is Sakyamuni Buddha, the first psychologist in human history. Professor Dr. Freeman Jiong from the Department of Psychology, Chinese University of Hong Kong, Sunchen, at the regional professional conference had highlighted that Sakyamuni Buddha was probably the first psychologist in the current human history. Sister Mian, our speaker, will explore tenets of Buddhism, example, the Mahasati Patana Sutta, the four Brahma Viharas, etc., that have many commonalities or had inspired modern psychological interventions like mindfulness-based and compassion-based therapies, gratitude practice, etc. Our speaker, Dr. Sister Mian Lo, first learned Dharma and meditation at the UKM Buddhist Fellowship in 1989. After graduation and over the years, she is still an active practitioner and frequent speaker at BGF, Subangjai Buddhist Association, KMBS, KL Buddhist Mental Health Association, and several other Buddhist organizations. Professionally, Sister Mian is a clinical psychologist working with individuals, couples, families, workplace, and communities for more than 25 years, providing EAP, leadership coaching, corporate training, crisis intervention, psychotherapy, psychological assessment, lecturing, and supervision. This talk will be having direct sign language interpretation by a very well-known sign language uh, practitioner, Sister Tan Li Bi. She is a freelance sign language interpreter for the deaf, also a court interpreter for the deaf, and a tourism guide. She studied at the Galaudet University of Washington, D.C., a private university for the education of the deaf and hard of hearing in 1985. She also appears frequently on Brita RTN, doing language interpretation for the Prime Minister and other events. So let us put our palms together and welcome Sister Mian and Sister Libby for their sharing. Over to you, Sister Mian. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Bobby. So uh, firstly, a very good morning to all the venerables, yeah, venerable monks and nuns, if uh, there are some of them that is attending uh, this talk this morning. And of course, to all fellow uh, brothers and sisters in the Dharma. And of course, to BGF for inviting me to share on this topic. And uh, like what Brother Bobby say, yeah, it's very much inspired. Uh, I was very much inspired recently at a professional conference where one of the fellow colleagues actually uh, openly in a regional conference talk about the Sakyamuni Buddha as the psychologist. Yeah? So, and uh, of course, from there, uh, I brave myself to take up uh, you know, this uh, interesting topic and have today sharing with all of you. Yeah? So apart from thanking BGF for hosting and organizing this talk, of course, a very Big thank you to our sister Libby, our sign language interpreter that uh, even volunteer her time despite her tight schedule. You can see that she's actually in Angkasapuri office now because she got a 12 o'clock, uh, you know, government interview to interpret. Yeah. So therefore, our talk finished at 11.30, just nice. Yeah. So and uh, of course, that's where uh, we are so blessed to have her. And naturally, yeah, this is also due to our hearing impact community that actually have requests yeah, that they would like uh, to have sign language interpretation for this talk. And I think Maha Sadhu yeah, to Theravada Buddhist Council Malaysia, when we started the uh, medical forum by our Buddhist medical uh, practitioner, Dr. Gan, Dr. Ong, Dr. Pang, I moderated, moderated that session. That was the first session we started with Sister Libby having the sign language interpretation, and we do have our hearing impact community joining us. So I hope the hearing impact community, they are here this morning, or if not, they can actually watch uh, the recording on Facebook Live later on. Yeah. So we hope, we hope that uh, we will share our Dharma, yeah? expanding it beyond uh, our usual cozy Buddhist community 
and uh, now to the hearing impact community. Yeah, so the, thank you to everyone for this effort. So for today's talk, I have uh, not done any slides at all. So for those uh, who are very visual, uh, you know, you like to have visual to have slides. Uh, so my apologies. Yeah, so I, I, I had hectic schedule recently and uh, I'm not good at making slides. So therefore I've decided out of compassion for myself, right? So I'm not gonna stress myself out making slides, but therefore I'll still try my best, yeah? To share with all of you today on this topic. So what I've done is that I've scribbled down, you know, on a piece of paper, of course, the outline to share with you guys. And one of the interesting experience myself as I'm preparing for this talk is that, you know, Sakyamuni Buddha, you know, of course, I, I knew that even before, you know, Professor Freedom Leong talks about it, as, as young as I was back in UKM, yeah, it was pretty interesting, uh, my own journey of uh, being a psychologist, yeah. Just, just a little bit of background and uh, I, I, I want us to, to sort of like uh, perhaps use that to also inspire yourself looking at your own background. How did you come to learn, uh, you know, the Dharma? Yeah, for me, it was very interesting. All along, my ambition was to be a lawyer, but I couldn't get into the law faculty in University Malaya. Back in my days, yeah, you don't have private university available, right? And also my family, we couldn't afford. Yeah, so the, anyway, I couldn't get into the law faculty of UM and, uh, you know, higher education, you know, of course, that time they allocate. So I was allocated to UKM, to the faculty of social science and placed under the department of psychology. So I did not aspire to be a psychologist. Yeah, somehow I ended up in the Department of Psychology and that's how I pursue my bachelor degree. And then later on, I pursue my master's degree in clinical, specializing in clinical psychology. Yeah, but it was also so interesting back in the UKM years, uh, right from my bachelor degree years. Yeah, that was how, you know, I first attended of course, being traditional Chinese, right? Coming from Chinese family, you know, we have Guan Yin at home and so on and so forth. So naturally, I already, of course, have that inclination. And after attending the UKM Buddhist Fellowship uh, Dharma class, we call it common class every Friday, yeah? From 12 to 2, we have our gathering in one of the lecture hall. It totally changed my life, yeah? So you can imagine that concurrently, yeah, I was studying psychology, right, as my bachelor degree. And at the same time, those were the years that we were so blessed to have really, really, you know, noble teachers, especially our late chief, Venerable K. Sri Damananda, who came to the campus and gave us regular Dharma talk. Yeah, and of course, many, many more Dharma speakers that have also uh, uh, came and uh, shared Dharma with all of us as undergraduate in the university. So all in all, it was pretty interesting that my journey as a psychologist, right from the beginning, you know, as I begin my professional journey, yeah, I also uh, started my Dharma journey at the same time, yeah. First year bachelor degree in UKM, yeah. So it started concurrently. And even back then, you know, I think by second year, third year, of course, when I understood more about the, uh, you know, the various uh, uh, sub area, sub field of psychology, and then of course, learning Dharma concurrently, I really realized that actually our Sakyamuni Buddha is the greatest psychologist of all. Of course, you know, all other, you know, professional psychologists, you know, the ancient one like Sigmund Freud, Carl Rogers, so on and so forth. Of course, they are really wonderful psychologists too, yeah? But of course, for me, having these two paths of learning together, it was definitely, uh, I think, a great blessing, a great blessing for myself, yeah? That uh, I'm able to learn and embrace and practice, yeah? Both of these paths concurrently yeah 
So that's a little bit of history uh, of where I came from and how, you know, fast forward, you know, 26 years down the road today, yeah, this year is probably the 26 years that I've been practicing as a clinical psychologist, yeah. So, the, you know, there's, there's so much, so much of the Buddhist teaching or the, the Buddha Sakyamuni's uh, teaching in our current world, yeah for me to share. I think we can end up not 11.30 this morning, right? I think we can sit actually whole day, yeah? As we reflect, contemplate, discuss, and learn together about the Dharma. It is so, so rich, yeah? But for today, for this morning, yeah, due to the limited time we have, I have decided that, uh, you know, I'll just anchor on a few, yeah? So I'm also going to anchor our talk this morning, yeah? Not for mental health professional, yeah, not for fellow colleagues, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, counsellors, social worker, not for them, but really more for the community, yeah. Perhaps uh, I can share from my perspective, how do I, as a psychologist, when I help or support a person in need, yeah. So this is a term that I'm going to use, yeah, and this is the term we actually use uh, for uh, under the Buddhist counseling, you uh, the BGF counseling unit, yeah, uh, the individual that uh, seek for counseling, yeah, under uh, you know Jam helpline or the Buddhist Jam fellowship counseling unit, the traditional name, we call them person in need. So I'm going to quote this word person in need, yeah, as I narrate how in my process as a psychologist applying the Dharma in supporting the person in need, okay? So I'm going to do that. And hopefully, as you are actually, you know, spending your Sunday morning, you know, listening to this uh, Facebook Live, I would like you to also perhaps use some of the guide or the steps that I'm going to share with you, yeah? To apply it in assessing, yeah? In assessing your own current situation, especially if you're experiencing uh, stresses in your life, challenging emotion, challenging relationship, or even, you know, physical bodily pain, medical illness, yeah? So in a way, actually all of us uh, is under the category of person in need, yeah? What more, yeah, under the current pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, for this one and a half year, yeah? Naturally, almost all of us, yeah, will be under the category of person in need, yeah, at some point, at some point, perhaps in this one and a half year, yeah, we could have felt so stressed out, yeah, or even angry, depressed, yeah, frustrated, yeah, so all of us probably, uh, you know, like I say, are person in need, yeah, so I want you to do uh, that, yeah, look at it uh, as a, a application, yeah, application to help the, yourself uh, to do, you know, some self-assessment, yeah, of these conditions uh, that I've just described, okay? So what I'm going to do is that uh, we're going to do uh, the sharing about 45, 50 minutes, yeah? I'll try to watch uh, <laughs> well, the, the clock besides me. And then uh, after that, we're going to open for Q&A because that's the most meaningful part. Yeah, for you to ask question. And from the question is usually that's where we learn about application. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Yeah, so but before, before I go into the topic, I want to do something. Yeah, I want us to do a short practice. Yeah, so for this short practice, I would like to invite all of you, wherever you are watching the Facebook Live. Yeah, either you're sitting on the chair or you're sitting on your meditation cushion, yeah, it is all right. So what I would like to invite everybody to do is that intentionally, yeah, just adjust your sitting posture, yeah, those on the chair, have your two soles of the feet on the floor, yeah, nicely comfortable, you know, placed on the ground or of the floor if you're sitting on the chair. Those of us, who are sitting on a meditation cushion, then feel your calf muscle. Feel your calf muscle, yeah? That is actually touching your meditation cushion, okay? Your calf muscle. I'm using the hand to demonstrate, yeah? Okay, so feel that, okay? So we were going to start with that, yeah? So 
intentionally shift your you know position of sitting with the two soles of the feet on the ground or the two calf muscle yeah being pressed on the meditation cushion and of course you can invite yourself to close your eyes fully if you're comfortable to do this exercise or if not drop your gaze away from your laptop and away from your phone yeah so just drop your gaze so that you're not distracted by the light drop it to the floor or a spot that you're comfortable with okay so having done that i would like to invite you to bring your attention to the soles of your feet or to your calf muscles whatever it is for you just notice is there any sensation at the soles of the feet or the calf muscles. Explore with curiosity. Explore with interest. Is there any sensation at the two soles of my feet and my two calf muscles? And then slowly shift your awareness or your attention to your toes your 10 toes again very curious very gentle explore any sensation at my toes and then gently move upwards for those of you sitting on the chair move upwards to the calf muscles and those of us on the meditation cushion bring our attention now to the calf muscles. Again, any sensation in the calf muscles? Just explore gently, curiously. Then move upwards to your knees, both knees very important part of our legs explore any sensation felt could it be tingling or even sourish pain at the knee whatever sensation that you notice just be aware and acknowledge them moving upwards to your thigh Big area of muscles at the thigh area. Any sensation there? Next, move upwards to your buttock. As you are sitting on the chair or the cushion. How does it feel like? sitting this body this whole body sitting right here right now what are the sensation at the bottom touching the seat warm hard soft whatever sensation that you sense just be aware and acknowledge them you don't have to change anything whatever sensation that you have sensed just be aware and acknowledge them moving upwards now i would like you to turn inwards to your mind to your inner experience What thoughts are running through your minds? What feelings is being felt? Or what body sensation is being sensed right now? Again, you don't have to change anything. 
whatever experience that has arise, just be aware and acknowledge them. Thoughts, feeling, body sensation, all this inner experience arising, arising, arising. Next, bring your awareness and attention to your breath. Wherever you feel your breath is, some of us, we feel it at the nostril, the nose area. Some of us feel it in the chest area. Some of us feel it at our tummy rising and falling as we breathe in and out. Or some of us feel that, oh, it's just the whole body. Yeah, wherever it is, it's all right. I would like to invite you very gently, softly, just pay attention to your breath. Breathing in and out. Just that gentle awareness and attention on the breath. Breathing in and out. Gentle focus and attention on the breath, yeah? As you breathe in and out. If you notice your mind wandering away, perhaps thinking about lunch, it's all right. Just be very gentle to guide your mind back to focus on the breath. Gentle, gentle guiding back and gentle awareness and attention on the breath. Just do that. If the thoughts wander away many times, Gently, many times, guide it back to the breath. And just continue breathing in and out. Again, gently, I would like us to shift to the next step. This time, I would like you to expand your awareness or your attention now to the whole body. As though the whole body is breathing right now. So just now was a focus, awareness or attention. Now it is a more expanded or spacious awareness. And the breath is still breathing in and out. So this whole body is sitting right here, breathing in and out. This expanded, spacious awareness of the breath. Just breathing in and out. You can reflect on this breath 
perhaps feeling grateful, feeling gratitude towards the breath for keeping us alive. Our gratefulness and gratitude towards the breath that nourish us inside out. Breathing in and out every day, every moment of our life. So with gratitude towards the breath, appreciating the breath for nourishing this body of ours, keeping us alive. And as we come to the end of this exercise, I would like us to just send a loving and kind wishes towards ourselves and loving kindness wishes to everybody on this Facebook Live and everybody else yeah, in the whole universe. Metta or loving kindness to be shared with ourselves and everybody in our life, in this very life. Radiate that sense of lovingness, kindness towards ourselves and towards everyone. Sensing and feeling this love and kindness. And after we have done that, I would like us to transition slowly back to the class. I would like you to take your own time. Give yourself that space the transition from the exercise back to our Facebook Live session, especially those of you who close your eyes, be gentle when you reopen them as we have lights in the room. So each of us take our own time to transition back to the class. having some tears in my own eyes. <laughs> I'm gently, yeah, trying to make sure that the eyes is fully open back. Okay, so I guess everybody is back from the exercise. Yeah, so to, uh, I start off with this meditative exercise or this meditative practice because for me, this is one of the most core teaching or practice that Buddha has taught us. And to me personally, yeah, this is very important. Yeah. And the meditative practice or the mental cultivation or development is actually yeah, part of our noble eightfold path. Okay. So I started with that for us to practice it. Yeah. So that we don't only just talk and listen, but we make the right effort to have the practice, which is the meditative practice taught by the Buddha. I'm going to go into that uh, uh, in more detail later on. Yeah. So, but I want you to remember, yeah, this meditative practice is one, one of the most helpful, yeah, supportive and useful, if you want to call it the modern term, yeah, stress management technique. Yeah, so and, uh, it is part and parcel of Noble Ifu Path, like I mentioned. So, for me, yeah, as a psychologist, one of my interventions, especially if I assess the person in need, yeah, is in the condition that able to practice, I usually would like to take the opportunity 
to begin to support them in this journey. Yeah. And of course, I practice in a common community. Yeah. So, and uh, to your, you may be surprised, non Buddhists nowadays, they are very open to meditative practice. Of course, thanking to the mindfulness, the circular mindfulness movement in the world of psychology. Yeah. So, it has become a very accepted scientific practice. Yeah. But here we are. Yeah, it came from the Buddha, yeah, 2,600 years ago. Yeah, so for today, Buddha, Sakyamuni Buddha, as the greatest psychologist of mankind, yeah, in this current world, yeah, what I would like to do is to share with you a few of the important fours. In the Buddha's teaching, there's a lot of four, four, group of four, yeah. So I was figuring out, let's do that. Yeah. And interestingly, the group of four are what I call the very basic fundamental or foundation of Sakyamuni Buddha's teaching, the 45 years that he has taught the world. Yeah. So, of course, the first four, yeah, uh, you definitely can make a correct guess is the four noble truths. Yeah. So I'm going to start with the Four Noble Truth. And within the Four Noble Truth, of course, we have the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah. And then I'm going to highlight the Four Brahma Viharas. Yeah. For Four Brahma Viharas, it's very important to practice because we do have yeah, the four challenging emotions that all of us yeah, as human beings will experience. Yeah. So Four Noble Truth. Four Brahma Viharas, four challenging emotion, and of course, we can't get away uh, when we talk about four noble truth and the noble eightfold path by addressing the three plus one. What is the three plus one? Now, for me, the three plus one is yeah the three evil roots, yeah greed, hatred, delusion, and of course plus tanha, craving, clinging or attachment. So that is my three plus four. I'm sorry, three plus one equals to four. Yeah. So the groups of four. Yeah. So I'll try to do the sharing within the group of all these fours I've mentioned. Yeah. So firstly, let us start with the four noble truth. Yeah. And indeed, yeah, why is it that Buddha spends so long to just teach human beings? And of course, Buddha not only taught us human beings, right? Buddha also taught the devas, yeah, the heavenly realm beings, yeah. Of course, we can't see, yeah. And during the Buddha's time, yeah, the devas and the heavenly beings do come to listen to the Dharma talk, yeah. What a blessing they had, yeah. And uh, of course, the four noble truths, as taught by the Buddha itself, even if we just look at this itself, it is so challenging. As a psychologist, literally. The person in needs that come and see me professionally. I'm sure my all fellow colleagues, medical and mental health professional colleagues, face the same problem. Let's look at the first noble truth, dukkha. The first noble truth itself, the truth of suffering. Yeah. The deep significant existence of human being, the two sides, the birth and the death, and all types of suffering in between birth and death. Do we truly understand? Yeah, this is, this is a very first interesting question to ask ourselves. Do we really understand the first noble truth, the truth of suffering? I can tell you, actually, a lot of person in need that come for counseling, they are very challenged even to acknowledge and accept the first noble truth, yeah? The truth of the suffering. Yeah, they are suffering. Of course, when they come and see a psychologist, like naturally they are struggling, yeah, or suffering. That's why they, they, they came and see us or else they won't come and see us, right? Yeah, we are full of stigma. Our services is full of stigma. But yet, it is so interesting, right? The struggle of understanding the first noble truth, the truth of suffering, yeah? Second noble truth, the origin and the cause of suffering. 
Yeah, and as fellow Buddhists, we know, yeah, Samudaya, second noble truth, the origin or the cause of suffering is Tanha. Yeah, the, the three in one, that the, the three plus one that I talk about, right? The Tanha, yeah, the craving or the clinging or the attachment, yeah, uh, of course, combined with the great hatred and delusion. Yeah, so that itself, yeah, even though, though we know. Yeah, the origin or the cause of suffering, which is Tanha. And the third noble truth, Niroda, is the cessation or the ending of this suffering. And the answer is so clear, right? Yeah, if we know the origin or the cause of suffering, to end the suffering is to let go of the Tanha, right? So, but of course, yeah, it is not easy at all. Yeah, right from beginning, yeah, the step one, the first noble truth itself, people struggle. Yeah, people even struggle to acknowledge yeah, the truth of suffering. What more yeah, to acknowledge the origin and the cause of suffering? And what more yeah, to want to end, one thing to end, yeah, the cessation to, uh, uh, of suffering. Yeah? And of course, yeah, the great part about our Lord Buddha is that he has given us the path yeah, to me. Yeah, practicing the noble eightfold path. Yeah, just come back to learn to practice the noble eightfold path because Maga, yeah, the fourth noble truth, yeah, is the path given by the Buddha for us to practice. And I truly, I truly, yeah, try my best to practice the noble eightfold path in my life and in supporting the person in need that come for counseling to look at which area of the Noble Eightfold Path that they are challenged with, yeah? Because it's all connected back to the Four Noble Truth, yeah? So here we go, the first set of four, yeah? So, the, and, and uh, right from this beginning, all of us are challenged. I want you to ask yourself, yeah, to reflect on your struggle, on your stresses, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, to, how are you in applying in accepting the Four Noble Truth. Like how I urge you just now to look at the truth of suffering, identify the origin or the cause of the suffering. And to end this suffering, yeah, we already have a way, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. Let me move next to the Noble Eightfold Path, right? Because this is the Maga, yeah, the Fourth Noble Truth. Let's take the, no uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, and uh, our Sakyamuni Buddha again, yeah, really the greatest psychologist. He has arranged this noble evil path, yeah, in a way that for me, you know, if we just practice, yeah, this noble evil path, of course, it has, uh, you know, we can group it in three categories to help us to be able to understand and practice more systematically, yeah. It has already given to us. But of course, this is where we need to learn how to apply it. Okay, knowing all our stresses, our challenging emotion, challenging relationship, the conflict that we have, and so on and so forth, or the physical illness, the pain, and so on and so forth that we have, how we're gonna apply the noble eightfold path. Okay, noble eightfold path starts, uh, and of course, traditionally all texts, yeah, will start with the right understanding, followed by the right thought, yeah. Right understanding, right thought. This is group under the wisdom, Panya group. And it's very interesting yeah, uh, to look at this group. Yeah? Let's start with the Panya group, right understanding and right thought. Right understanding itself is actually referring to, do we really understand the Four Noble Truth? Yeah, of course, it's linked back, right? Yeah, yeah? that's how the connection comes. Yeah, so again, if we still don't understand the Four Noble Truth, yeah? yeah? Knowing the truth of suffering and the, the cause of the suffering and know that we can end the suffering, you know? If we still don't get it, yeah? So that's where right understanding itself as the first path to practice, it is challenging. So this is where, you know, this right understanding, yeah? is of course over the course of the Buddha's discourses. Yeah? Many, many suttas, combination. Yeah? You can actually see that it all points back to the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? Points back to the Four Noble Truths. So again, our homework 
our homework is to go back. Yeah. And again, this first path, right? Right understanding. Revisit, reinvestigate. What is our right understanding towards the Four Noble Truth? Okay. So this is the first path or the first practice. Yeah. And of course, the second practice, right thought. Right thought, actually, Buddha talked about that selfless renunciation. The thought of unconditional love, the thought of non-violence. Yeah. So right thought, yeah. Actually, Buddha talked about this, yeah, talking about non-attachment, the again, the renunciation, the letting go, yeah, very connected to the third noble truth, right? Yeah, the cessation of suffering, right? So to practice right thought, how do we cultivate in our life? Yeah, that we will have this thought of letting go, non-attachment, renunciation, the thoughts of unconditional love, the thoughts of non-violence, non-harm in our life, in everything that we do, from you know, our thoughts, uh, you know, feeling and behavior. Yeah. So right thought, yeah, the second path. Yeah. So that's why these two paths is grouped under the wisdom group. Yeah, because if we don't practice these two paths, right, we will not have wisdom. We will not have wisdom in us. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, for fellow Buddhists, in many many Dharma talk, you will listen uh, about this from a lot of the speaker. Yeah, our Buddhist practice, especially the two important component, we need to have the first wing wisdom and the second wing compassion. Right, we need to have the two wing to be balanced. Yeah, so if you're, you know, imagining uh, you're flying, you need to have these two wings to balance your life, right? Which is the wisdom and compassion. Yeah, and that will bring us to the second group of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah, the second group is actually the ethical or the moral conduct, right? So this group is very interesting, the ethical conduct. Yeah, it actually refers actually what Buddha was talking about in this three path. Yeah, is that practice of uh you know universal love and compassion to fellow human beings for the good and the happiness of the many, out of compassion for all human beings. Yeah, so literally, yeah, the ethical conduct group of practice, yeah, from uh, right speech right action to right livelihood we are practicing this actually for the good and happiness of all human beings out of compassion of human being we are practicing right speech right action right livelihood and what does it uh, entail this tree yeah so right speech itself yeah is so important in fact a lot of factors that lead us to get into conflict is actually speech, yeah, our communication. And in all our relationship, yeah, this is the interesting part, right? We don't live alone, yeah, in this world. All of us are interconnected, yeah, our interpersonal relationship. That is one of the highest area of stress, yeah, if you ask me, yeah, from the counseling, the psychological aspect, yeah, people come and see us, the professional, uh, mental health professional, yeah, this is a huge area. Yeah, the challenges in interpersonal relationship. And a lot of time I will assess the person in need, yeah, in this area, yeah, very detailed, yeah, especially in terms of the right speech. If in terms of the communication, yeah, things has gone wrong, naturally, yeah, you will have challenging relationship, you will have challenging emotion, challenging stress, yeah, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you will be challenged with that. Yeah. So of course, right speech refer us to the practice of, you know, whatever that come out from this mouth of ours. Yeah. It is of usefulness, helpfulness, supportiveness, yeah, to ourselves and to the person that we are speaking to. Yeah. That that mutual uh, you know, support or even actually the mutual respect to each other is a very important practice in right speech, yeah? If we were to, you know, gossip, slander, 
or cursing, you know, all those, of course, are the wrong speech, right? Yeah. So, of course, it's going to be uh, damaging or hurting, yeah, uh, in our the interpersonal relationship. Yeah. So, right speech itself, yeah, it's not easy to manage or to practice, right? Because it all also goes back, yeah, to what we are challenged with regarding the right understanding and the right thought. If under the right thought, we have wrong thought, <laughs> right? We have ill will, we have hatred, yeah? So naturally, our speech is going to be wrong speech, yeah? Not right speech, right? So you see how all this is all laid out by Buddha so perfectly, the practice, yeah? So right speech is an area in terms of uh, psychological intervention is a huge area. So a lot of time, I spend a lot of time teaching the person in need actually effective communication skill, yeah, or mindful and compassionate communication skill, yeah, because if they are able to do that, at least that will ease or that will be a remedy for them to go and manage the troubled relationship, okay? right speech, right action. Again, what we do, right? So to, are we doing things, yeah? Like I say, you know, out of love and compassion or are we, our behavior, yeah? this action, yeah, refers to the action or the behavior. Are we doing things that harm others or harm within ourselves, right? So the right action, yeah? It's gonna put us into whether we are going to have our life, you know, peaceful and happy, or chaotic or full of fear, right? The right action, yeah? And of course, we strive to practice the right action. Right action, uh, you know, being kind and compassionate in our behavior, yeah? Our generosity, yeah? Uh, in our life, yeah? To help others. Uh, and then our compassion, yeah? To reach out to help others too, yeah? It's all under right action. Right livelihood, the next one. It refers to what we do as lay people, especially lay people, yeah, in our life. Yeah, we need to conduct a certain work or profession in our life. So if we are in a profession that is going to put us in a very conflicting position or even violate our ethical and moral principle, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be stressed out. Yeah, so a lot of times, yeah, because my expertise is actually in our workplace psychology, right? So I actually support uh, a lot of employee population, workplace, yeah, to, uh, to do uh, workplace assessment, so on and so forth. Yeah, and this is huge, yeah. So it is true. If you are working under a difficult manager or boss, naturally, you're going to be more stressed out. Yeah, compared to if you're working under a kind and compassionate manager or boss. Yeah, so the right livelihood. Yeah, it goes beyond, you know, of course, you know, uh, a lot of traditional texts will talk about not to be in the profession that involves in killing, harming and all those things, right? Firearms, butchering and things like that. But now in our modern world, yeah, we have to look at it from a, a different angle. Yeah, for me, yeah, it will be usually that ethical principle of that company, yeah, the leadership of the company, ethical principle, right down to, of course, to the day-to-day -day operation and especially where we are positioned. Yeah, how is that in terms of our relationship with our immediate team members, our managers, our uh, you know, supervisors, and of course, the company. Yeah? So right livelihood itself, yeah, we need to look at what to do. What are the coping skills? that you can apply, yeah, if you do have this difficult manager or boss that I'm talking about, yeah. How do you practice right speech? Because all you want is the right and right action. All you want is to strangle and curse this, you know, manager or boss that is being so unkind towards you, right? Right livelihood. So again, this group of practice itself, if something is, you know, challenging you, Either one of the path, and usually it's all three paths, yeah, it's going to be challenged, yeah, when you have a difficult situation, you know, that itself, yeah, uh, <laughs> the truth of suffering, back to the first noble truth, yeah, is, is that, right? And of course, the last group, 
yeah, the med mental development or mental cultivation samadhi group, which is the right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is the meditative practice. Yeah. So if you have recalled just now the exercise I guided, literally, I was actually demonstrating or guiding you to practice right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Of course, in a very short manner, huh? a very short meditative practice. What we have done is that right effort. I put in the right effort to one thing to share with all of you to have this good practice. So all of us put an effort to this practice just now. So to, in a way, uh, in right effort, right? So we want to enhance what is good that has arise. Yeah. Or if the good has not arise, we want to make it arise. That's why I started the meditative practice. Yeah. And during the practice, yeah, remember I mentioned if you're wandering thoughts, gently guide it back to focus on your breath. Because putting in right effort again, this monkey mind of ours, this wandering mind of ours is going to do that. Yeah. So the, which means that it could even the, you know arise negativity and so on and so forth. So right effort again, when you notice there's negativity that had arisen, we would like to curb that. We would like to reduce that. Yeah. And now we use our meditative practice as part of our training of the mind. So when I say gently bring your wandering mind back to focus on your breath, you're putting in right effort. Yeah. So, so yeah, in a very quick nutshell, that's how I'm going to explain to you right effort. Yeah. And right mindfulness. Yeah. The practice. Yeah, the meditative practice following the Maha Satipatthana Sutta. And of course, the Maha Satipatthana Sutta itself, the right mindfulness itself, yeah, it is very rich. Yeah? This is another set of homework that we need to go and do. Yeah? I'm not able to go into the detail. But what I did just now to demonstrate to the exercise to you, right mindfulness practice is, yeah, we start with the awareness of the body, Kaya Nupasana. Yeah, remember I start with uh, our soles of the feet, the toes, the calf muscles, you know, the body. Yeah, of course, uh, I would usually do the whole body, but uh, today, short of time, so I only did until the buttock, <laughs> right? Then I switch, yeah, to, to the mind. Okay, so in a way, yeah, if Mahasatipatthana Sutta talks about Kaya Nupasana, yeah, this awareness of the body, Vedana Nupasana, the awareness of the sensation and the feeling, yeah. Yeah, chitta nupasana, yeah, the awareness of the activity of the mind. Yeah, when I did that steps, yeah, turn inwards. Just be aware and acknowledge whatever arising thoughts, feeling, or body sensation. You know, I group all three. Yeah, the activity of the mind. Yeah. So in a way, um, in a very you know simple way, yeah, very quick way, yeah, to guide you. Yeah, to, to, to actually practice that, you know. So, but of course, this whole practice, yeah, the intensive practice, yeah, uh, you, you know, it's not to just a, a one-off kind of a short practice I guide you, yeah. We need to go and do our homework, yeah, our daily meditation practice. And of course, we can have our short practices and more in-depth uh, practices, yeah. But that's actually, I'm leading you towards Chitta, uh, Chitta Nupasana. And of course, Dhamma Nupasana, yeah? the realization of Dhamma cannot happen. Yeah? Cannot happen if Kaya Nupasana, Vedana Nupasana, Chitta Nupasana uh, is not being practiced. It doesn't work this way. Yeah? If you look at this bottle, okay? Okay. A lot of us, our mind is actually like that. Yeah, every day we are busy, 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 busy right? So the you know, so the mind you know can get very, very chaotic. Yeah, like this silvery thing, uh, you know, get very chaotic. But then this is where our meditative practice hopefully help us. Even the three minutes, the five minutes that we could allow this bottle to stay, you know, still. So hopefully the mind will also calm down. Yeah, the mind, when it calms down, it will be clearer. Yeah, I'm looking through this bottle now, uh, through the, uh, to the laptop uh, camera. Uh. So just now, I couldn't see because 
you know, there's so many defilements, yeah? The, the three plus one, evil roots, if you want to put it, it's all there, you know, when it's high activity, yeah? I can't see through the bottle, yeah? I can't, I can't look at the, the camera lens. But when, but when we train this mind to settle down, to calm down, hopefully all those defilements, impurities will sink to the bottom, at least settle down at the bottom. It may not be totally clear, but at least a clearer condition of the mind. When the mind is clearer, now, now I can look through the bottle to look at the camera lens. Just now I couldn't see. Yeah, so this right effort, right mindfulness, and of course, with right concentration, yeah, these three practices come together for mental cultivation, is the practice of actually training our mind, training our mind to do this every day, every day, hopefully, yeah, because every day, our life is so busy, right? So we need, we need to really have this compassionate practice towards ourselves so that you know we are able to allow our mind to settle down to calm down to rest to feel at ease when the mind is able to do that it's much more clearer yeah and this clarity this clarity is the one that will help us to realize dharma dharma nupasana yeah so the law of nature Dhamma is what Buddha taught. Yeah, actually, all of us can know the answer or can find out the answer. Yeah, all the struggle that we are in, we're able to actually find the answer. But because we were challenged with this, yeah, that's why we couldn't see. Yeah, then of course, when we come for professional help, yeah, that's where, yeah that uh, professional psychologists like me, you know, will guide you, the person in need, on how to practice so that you can train your mind, yeah? Start with the mind first, with this clarity, yeah? So, the, you know, I, I hope this short demonstration will give you the clear clarity about this final group of Noble Eightfold Path practice, okay? So that's, uh, you know, our right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. Okay, Ooh, it's 11 o'clock. Okay, you know, we only have 30 minutes left. So, of course, very quickly, yeah, I want to say that even you just go back again and again, yeah, trying to understand the Four Noble Truths, yeah, and within the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, practice that, yeah. A lot of Buddhists will get into a frantic, stressful stage, you know. Oh, you know, I've not meditated enough. Oh, I've not read uh, so many suttas, you know. You know, a lot of time. Let's, let's be realistic in this modern world, yeah. So that's why, you know, in psychological intervention, we are very practical and realistic. We cannot talk about theory, yeah, or even framework. Yeah, I'm presenting you this framework today, right? For Noble Truth and uh, Noble Eightfold Path. But we need to look at how do we apply it in our life, right? So go to that. So I urge you to just go back to this. Yeah, and how to add on this uh, helpful practice, yeah, is remember to practice our four Brahma Viharas. And remember, huh, as I'm talking about Four Noble Truth and the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, as the way, the way we can end uh, the suffering, yeah, the three plus one is around, uh, yeah, which is our tanha, yeah, our craving, clinging, and attachment uh, is around, uh, our greed, hatred, and delusion is around, yeah, and uh, it is everywhere around because that's the truth of suffering, right? So it's around, yeah, and I don't even have to talk about it, you know about it, yeah, your own greed, hatred, and delusion, yeah. Uh, and um, uh, of course, I would like to highlight the positive practice, which is the four Brahma Viharas. Yeah, the four Brahma Viharas become very important because in our this human life, mundane life, yeah, with the three plus one, I'm talking about the challenges. All of us struggle with what I call the four group of challenging emotion in the psychology of emotion in Buddhism. Yeah, the first group, anger and hatred first group second group 
yeah, which is uh, actually grief and sorrow, yeah. The third group is actually fear and anxiety. I think this third group, uh, we are in it now, right, in this pandemic, right, because we have a lot of fear and anxiety towards the uncertainty of this pandemic, yeah. And the fourth group, guilt and shame a lot of challenging relationship. The underlying challenges that I always find out, yeah, is the guilt and shame, yeah? So we have these four challenging emotions, yeah? So, but of course, you know, I'm short of time. I cannot go into the detail how to apply that, yeah? But with these four challenging emotions that we struggle with, yeah, that we may struggle with at one time or another in our life, especially grief and loss, yeah, in this pandemic, yeah, all of us actually... No, come to think of it, uh, definitely all three groups, uh, yeah, we will be experiencing it ourselves uh, in this pandemic, you know, looking at the three groups itself, yeah. Anger and hatred, yeah. I think the most immediate one, yeah, towards the government, towards the community, uh, not observing SOP and all those things, yeah. Anger and hatred, yeah. Fear and anxiety, like I see, towards this unknown and uncertainty of this virus, grief and sorrow. We have loss, yeah, they are death, yeah, death related to COVID-19. We have lost our usual way of living due to lockdown, yeah. We have lost, yeah, our financial security, economic is impacted. We have lost relationship, isolation, and so on and so forth, or even conflict. Divorce rates are rising this one and a half year, yeah. So we have a lot of grief and sorrow. Yeah. So with this four challenging emotion, yeah, from the, the beautiful the teachings of our Sakyamuni Buddha, yeah, how can we, you know, put into practice, yeah, as part of your daily practice, you know, it is something like your breath too, you know. So I will always say, you know, metta, karuna, upeka, and uh, and mudita is part and parcel of our life. So this four Brahma Vihara practice is highly recommended for all of us and of course metta the loving kindness practice yeah so i believe bgf has the metta class yeah by uh, dr dr Vitter v right so so metta practice karuna compassion yeah come karuna is an extended from metta and you know how i see karuna is of course related to suffering in the world right so karuna the definition is you know the deep awareness of the suffering of oneself and other living beings, yeah, with the wish and effort to alleviate the suffering. The deep awareness of the suffering of oneself, myself, and other living beings, you know, coupled with the wish and effort to alleviate the suffering, yeah. So, compassion is definitely in action, yeah. But for compassion to arise, for us to practice compassion, we need to have our metta or loving kindness bang ready. Yeah? It means we need to store, right? Yeah, we need to store the loving kindness, yeah, the lovingness and the kindness yeah, in the bank. So when we have suffering, then we can actually uh, you know, cope by actually practicing compassion. I have a beautiful quote I must share with you. Yeah. When the sunshine, when the sunshine of loving kindness. So, so in this poem, yeah, the loving kindness is equate to the sunshine. Yeah. So hopefully we store our solar energy, the sunshine. When the sunshine of loving kindness meet with suffering, meet with the tears of suffering, yeah, that's where compassion arises. Yeah. So therefore, metta and karuna practice. Is together, yeah, because we need metta, then only karuna, yeah, can actually arise, yeah. And this beautiful poem, yeah, uh, actually it came from Burma, you know, yeah, the rainbow of compassion, yeah. When the sunshine of loving kindness meet with the tears of suffering, the rainbow of compassion arises. That means that rainbow shines. That's what I meant by the action, because compassion is an action. Yeah, you help, yeah, the effort to alleviate the suffering. Yeah, so that's compassion. And of course, mudita, 
Yeah. So the you know with these two component, yeah. Uh, of course, another component that will help us is that we 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 remember to contain you know positiveness, right? That means a, a bundita is appreciative joy. Yeah, we do not need to like find joy, find happiness ourselves. But you know, other people when we see other people happy and joyful, we can rejoice together with them. Yeah, that's mudita, appreciative joy. Yeah, I like to use the word appreciative joy. Some some of the translation is called sympathetic joy, but I usually call it appreciative joy. When we are able to share the joy and happiness of other people. Joy and happiness will be felt within us. Yeah. So mudita is another beautiful practice. So mudita is actually an antidote towards jealousy and envy. Yeah. Are you why are they fellow? Huh? You know, you know, so on and so forth. You know that comparing the expectation. But if we practice mudita, we're able to rejoice together with the other person. Yeah. That's where we reduce jealousy and envy. You know, but going backwards, I forgot to mention. Of course, the antidote for hatred is loving kindness, right? Hatred, loving kindness, is very quite clear, right? And the antidote towards aversion, resistance, yeah, or suppression or avoidance, yeah, the the antidote for that uh, is actually compassion, because compassion, yeah, is that bravery, yeah of the action that I talk about to alleviate the suffering and having this bravery to alleviate the suffering, you know, we have the loving kindness to support us. Yeah. So we are not running away. We are not aversive yeah, towards suffering, but we are able to meet suffering and resolve the suffering. Yeah. So that's the beautiful compassion. Lastly, yeah, upeka or equanimity. Yeah, so the, it is, of course, the meditative practice is the balancing factor. Yeah, the balancing factor, uh, especially towards the loving kindness, you know, uh, uh, compassion and the appreciative joy with this balanced state of mind, you know, the equanimous mind. Yeah, and again, this is the two wing I'm talking about, right? The wisdom part and the compassion part. Yeah, if you are so loving, so kind, so compassionate, so appreciative, joy, but you don't have the wisdom and the balancing component. Yeah, so we call these people the good hearted fool. Yeah, so and this is very dangerous. Yeah, because you will be loving and helpful and compassionate you know you help other people but you forgot about yourself you forgot to re and recharge your own battery you'll be out of battery and that's what burnout is all about yeah burnout is all about yeah so in prevention yeah from stress distress stress lead to distress distress lead to burnout or what we call disorder the clinical condition where you may have to take medication and see psychiatrists. Yeah? Counseling may not be helpful at that point. The breaking down, mental, mental breakdown. Yeah? So, so the, we need to have this balance in practice. That's why Upeka comes in. So this is the four Brahma Viharas. Yeah? So with this, uh, you know, let me manage a little bit of logistics. Sister Libby needs to leave at 1130 so the, my apologies ahead to the hearing uh, impact community. She may not stay on with us, but I can, if you want to ask questions, you're willing to stay back 10 minutes, 15 minutes, yeah, post 11.30. This is where we are now going to open to the Q&A. Yeah? So I'll try my best uh, to answer the question that you have. We may not finish answering the question if there are a lot of questions, but I hope yeah, whatever I've managed to capture yeah, today in my sharing, bringing the, the essence of the teaching of our Sakya Muni Buddha, yeah, uh, definitely from a very psychological perspective, yeah, in looking at the challenges in our life or the truth of suffering. So with this, yeah, I'm going to end my sharing. I better end. <laughs> like I say, I can talk whole day yeah, on our great Sakya Muni Buddha. Yeah? So let us have the question, Brother Bobby, yeah, from the audience. <clears throat> Thank you, Sister Mien and uh, Sister Libby, for the very uh, empath the, the the very empathetic translation, <laughs> full of feelings. 
the where does the place of gratitude come in? Gratitude. Would gratitude okay. be similar to appreciative joy? Mm, okay. Let me think. I want. I don't answer it technically. Yeah. Ah, but interesting. Yeah. How do you position gratitude? Yeah. Mm, yeah, I, I would say it is probably, I mean, if we need to do that placing, yeah, let's place it to, uh, you know, uh, mudita plus gratitude, yeah, yeah, uh, but gratitude, yeah, uh, yeah, is 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 more than the appreciation, it is also that thankfulness, yeah, that thankfulness, that gratefulness, yeah, so, so, but it is, yeah, it, it will fit nicely, yeah, so probably our four Brahma Viharas, yeah, we have a plus one there, you know, with the gratitude practice, that will be very complete, yeah, in our especially uh, emotive or emotional based practices, yeah. That's how I'll answer that question, Brother Bobby, yeah, in a very short manner, yeah. Thank you, Sister Amin. Question from A.L. Chan. At times of sorrow, unable to get out of the box of suffering from the loss of loved ones, how to calm and distress from this situation? Mm. Okay. Grief and sorrow, right? Yeah. So that, that is uh, the group of the challenging emotion. Yeah. That is pretty huge. Yeah. And again, uh, like I say, you know, handling emotion is probably a, a, a weak point that many of us have. Huh? A weak point that many of us have in our education system. Yeah, the school, the college, the university never taught us about managing stress and emotion, right? We are not taught officially. Yeah? So therefore, it's hard to grapple with that. I would say a lot of times people struggle with grief and sorrow is, of course, yeah, is the pain that arises due to the attachment, yeah, to the clinging. Naturally, of course, that is why, you know, this birth of us as a human being in this life, right? So going back for us to practice the Four Noble Truths again and again and again, it is not easy for us to accept the loss of a loved one. Yeah. So therefore, that's why grief and sorrow arises in us. But if we go back to the First Noble Truth, naturally, right, birth and death, right? and of course, the suffering in between, it is the first noble truth that Buddha has actually highlighted to all of us. So therefore, how do we cope with this clinging, this attachment to our loved ones who have said goodbye? A few ways. One, especially if we feel that, uh, or if we have regret in the heart, uh, regret now comes in, uh, guilt and regret yeah, can come in, is that, we have not done enough for this loved one. And this loved one said goodbye too soon. Yeah. So then what can we do with this guilt and regrets? Even though this person is not here now. Yeah. So there are things we can do. Yeah. First, continue. Yeah. To practice and radiate metta and karuna for yourself. And this loved one that has passed away. Yeah. I say for yourself first is because you are struggling. Yeah. With the grief and sorrow. So when you are struggling. Yeah. You need it yourself first. Yeah. The lovingness, the kindness, the compassion towards yourself first. Only. Yeah. When you are able. Yeah. To, to radiate and practice this for yourself. It helps. It helps you to calm down, yeah? So that's why I say four Brahma Viharas is so important in our practice, isn't it? Yeah? So, so you know, Karuna and uh, uh, Metta, you know, hopefully it will help the arises of Upeka in us, the balanced state, yeah? So only with this that we are able to look at, yeah, this grief of ours or behind the grief, yeah, what are the guilt? What are the regrets? And realistically, what can we do now? Yeah, one is that you can continue to have conversation with this loved one that passed away, S apologize, say your sorry, seek for forgiveness if you need to. Yeah, do that. 
Yeah, or spiritually, we can go our spiritual route, go to our Dharma teacher, seek for forgiveness from the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Yeah, and of course, to our loved one. Yeah, if we have guilt or regrets. Yeah, then of course, through our own beautiful Buddhist practice. Yeah, this is where yeah perform dana. Yeah, to the sangha. Yeah, and rejoice in the merits of performing the dana to the sangha members and share these merits with this loved one that has passed on. Yeah, so look at what are the helpful, useful, practical practices that we can we can still do it now. Yeah, instead of yeah being ah. Uh, succumbing to this challenging emotion and succumbing to this challenging emotion, this grief and sorrow, it is actually the tanha in operation. Yeah? It is actually the tanha in operation. So again, we go back to the second noble truth. So from the second noble truth, third noble truth, right? We want to end this, right? So that's why we put into the practice of some of the practices Buddha has given us through the fourth noble truth. And, you know, of course, four Brahma Viharas. Yeah. So that will be the best way for us to handle this difficult emotion. Yeah. And I know grief and sorrow is uh, a challenging one. Yeah. So that's what I would recommend very quickly. Yeah. Because this is Q&A. Yeah? I can't go into very detailed guidance. Yeah. And to do detailed guidance too, I need to, to have more detail. Yeah, so that's how I'll answer that question. So, Brother Bobby, let's go to the next question. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Sister Mian, for the selfless sharing. Just now you mentioned about stress working under an unkind boss. How do we deal with fellow colleagues or subordinates who are selfish and unkind, which make the workplace toxic and the superiors pressurized? Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> this is a challenging one. Firstly, Firstly, especially now, yeah, today we are reminded of the four noble truths, yeah, and the three plus one, <laughs> three evil roots plus tanha, yeah. So, firstly, start with us understanding the truth of the suffering. This horrible boss or colleague, selfish colleague or whatever, they are struggling they are suffering yeah they are they are what swimming in the tanha if you want to put it there in the, in the, in the three plus one yeah so therefore a lot of people actually you know by nature by default are not horrible people nah? yeah but because yeah it's also this suffering these stresses of life yeah the challenges of life they do not know how to handle so they end up being worse. Yeah. So that's where, right, is we have to start with ourselves in terms of managing stress, distress, right? Because it will always spill to other people. Yeah. So a lot of people may from the external, like I say, seems like a selfish colleague, or you know, uh, you know, what do you call that demanding and uh, not understanding boss. Yeah. But they become like that, they become you know, angry, frustrated, demanding, or selfish, or avoidance, and so on and so forth, is because also they are struggling with their own suffering. If, if we can start off with understanding and reflecting on the first noble truth, hopefully, we will calm down ourselves. That is the practice, yeah? If not, we will get ourselves yeah, into their spiral, their negative spiral yeah, of anger, demandingness, and so on and so forth ourselves if we are not uh, careful. Or we keep on reacting, struggling, because they are hitting with us with all that. Yeah? So firstly, apply the first noble truth. All of us are suffering. Yeah? So they are suffering, definitely. Yeah? Of course, now I'm suffering because of, of their behavior. Right? So, of course, then what can I do? One is that I will make sure that I myself, you know, stay calm and stable. Yeah? I, 
I need to stay calm and stable so that, like I say, I don't get into their, their, their spiral of reactivity, right? Negative reactivity. So in order for me to stay calm and stable, mind and heart, yeah, that's where, that's what I'm talking about this whole morning, our practice, right? Understanding the Four Noble Truth. Practice your Noble Eightfold Path. Practice your Four Brahma Viharas. Yeah? There's no shortcut. There's no shortcut, right? So start. If you need to, let me give you a more direct tip. Yeah? You need to stay calm and stable, mind and heart and the body. Yeah? Start with the very basic self-care. Yeah? You need to remember to take your own rest, whatever little, little rest in between your very hectic work. You need to do that. You need to remember to drink a lot of water. You need to remember to eat your meals. Yeah. You need to remember to just shut down the laptop and go to bed. Yeah. No point working through midnight. Yeah. So that basic, of course, sometimes you need to rush huh? certain days. Yeah. But it cannot be like for one and a half year. If you have been doing that for one and a half year, naturally, now you are extremely stressed or distressed or even burnt out. Yeah? So go back. Our, our, our self-responsibility to ourselves, firstly, is to try our best to keep ourselves yeah, sane. Like I say, you know, how to keep my sanity. Yeah? How to keep ourselves sane, you know, at least stable and manageable go back to all the basic practices because you don't have much time. Yeah. So, but when you start with this basic practices itself, it supports you. It supports you. Yeah. If you get basic rest, like I say, this self-care is being practiced. You will be less tired, less grumpy, less frustrated. Yeah. Less anxious naturally. Yeah. So, and hopefully that will give you the energy yeah, to face this negativity, yeah, and of course, yeah, sometimes that negativity, that group is so big, and you can be very overwhelmed, and this is very serious, you know, this is very serious, Buddha have this, right, the Dhammapada have some of these, uh, you know, verses, right, one of the important verses is that, you know, if you associate with the fools, so you may become a fool, right, so again, the right livelihood, yeah, very seriously, you need to evaluate is this big salary, yeah, or this big famous company that I'm working with, but then, you know, with all these, uh, you know, political uh, chaos and uh, ethical conducts uh, all violated, uh, is there where I want to be? Or can I work in a different environment? Maybe the salary is lower but hopefully it's a much more you know, healthy environment to work with. So in work, in our profession, of course, sometimes we have to make these difficult choices. Or your financial needs is so high, you need to have this job. Then therefore, like I say, you know, the choice is only one. If you need to remain in this toxic environment, yeah, then therefore, hopefully your daily cultivation yeah, will make sure, yeah, your own battery is charged, is maintained, and not being sucked away by all this uh, negativity, like you see, yeah, so, so in a very short manner, yeah, so, so I, I can only advise you, go back to the very basic, if you need to, yeah, which is the self-care, which is including of self-compassion first to yourself, and of course, compassion to that other people. Like I say, understanding they are so-called all these negative people. Yeah, have compassion for them. They are actually struggling. I ask you to have compassion for them, not asking you to join them. Huh? <laughs> yeah, so, but understanding why they are struggling. Okay, so the, that's uh, the other practice. Yeah, very Bobby. That's that's how I'm going to answer this question. Yeah. Thank, so let us you, take Sister the Mian. final question. And then, of course, uh, then uh, Sister Libby can go off. I want her to go off and rest before her 12 o'clock session. Then, of course, I will stay on. Yeah. Let's take the, the last yeah. question for Sister Libby to translate. Yeah. Th th thank you, Sister Mian. 
Next question is actually most of it answered already. Uh, how can we take care of ourselves from work stress? And the additional part is, uh, is there any sutta that I can refer to in reading more about it? Don't read sutta, just practice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I rephrased myself, okay? Yes, go and read Sutta, okay? But, you know, don't just read Sutta. It's the practices, yeah? Okay, I need to stress that because sometimes we Buddhists, uh, we, we just read and read and read, you know, and we stay at a theoretical level. Just do it, just practice it. Can we start, like I say, revisiting? Okay, how am I going to, you know, do the practices yeah, so like Sister Mian says, so that, you know, I'm practicing all this Noble Eightfold Path, right? So just start with that. Invest your energy. Instead of reading page by page, and suttas is difficult to read, nah? suttas is difficult to read, yeah? So, so, and of course, yeah, if you're somebody who is very good and very quick in reading, of course, you can do that. But a lot of us are not like that, yeah, including myself, right? But every day of our life, you know, like I see, can we go back into the basic practices. Our noble eightfold path is being practiced. Start with right understanding. Whenever we feel angry, when we are reactive, huh? yeah? when we are judgmental, we are critical, yeah? reflect right understanding. Okay? Right view. Are we in a wrong view by being judgmental, being critical? Yeah? So, that practice itself, you're already practicing the right view or right understanding, right? So whenever, you know, we feel so frustrated, like how we want to curse, <laughs> curse somebody, right? Yeah, then we pause ourselves. Okay, right thought refer to the thoughts of love and non-violence, <laughs> right? So the thought of selfless renunciation or non-attachment. So I'm not going to attach myself to this view or this opinion that as I'm reading it, you know, and especially on social media, you know, I'm reacting to it. So that's your practice of right thought. Okay. So then again, you know, right speech. Huh? Sometimes uh, in our mind, uh, oh, yo, we are cursing people, you know, we're scolding people and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Or, you know, we are cursing or scolding ourselves too catch yourself that is not right speech let us remember okay if i am so tired so angry and frustrated can i have right speech by consoling ourselves mian is okay yeah you are tired you are angry yeah it's okay it's okay just say or radiate some loving kindness to yourself some loving kindness phrases to yourself, say that to yourself. May I come down? Yeah, may I come down? May I be able to get resources to help me with my problem? Yeah, right speech, right? We are practicing right speech, right? So please go back. You know, I find that noble eightfold path is so beautiful to practice every day in your life. Yeah, so, so that's how I'll answer the question about the sutta, and of course all the way down, huh? you know, huh? I'm going to go all the way down, but I don't want to go all the way down. Yeah. So, so the, because I've mentioned that just now and just like, I, I always like Nike slogan, right? Just do it, right? Just practice noble if path. Yeah. Of course, with all this, uh, the four noble truth, you know, the three plus one, four Brahma Viharas, all embedded. Yeah. So practice this. You will find that you will learn to manage your stress, your challenging emotion, your challenging relationship in your life, in whichever area, in the work area, at home, as a couple, as a parent, with your child, with your children, yeah, in family system, yeah. So it's all applicable. Go back and revisit. I know, yeah, today it's, it's, it may be a bit dense and rushed, yeah, but my strong advice to all of us is that please revisit the Noble Eightfold Path. Okay? So, so, so I'm, I'm going to answer it that way, Brother Bobby. Yeah? So we are at yeah. 11.32. Yeah? And Sister Libby, yeah? Out of compassion for yourself, if you need rest and break before your 12 o'clock uh, round of interview translation, please go ahead. 
you know, leave our Zoom call and uh, go and take your break, drink your water, get ready with your nice coat, yeah? Because your, yours is going to be an official government interview. So go and do that. I can stay on a little bit more, yeah? So I can answer the rest of the question. Uh, maybe another 10 more minutes because I, I can see from the chat box, uh, there are more questions to what I think Brother Bobby has highlighted. So Sadhu, Maha Sadhu to Sister Libby for the sign language uh, interpretation today, this morning. Sadhu to you. We, we stop here. Uh, thank, thank you, Sister Mian. Thank you, Sister Libby, for the wonderful sharing. Uh, if I have strayed from the true path, may I never do so again. If I have carelessly hurt someone today by words or deeds, May I be more mindful the next time. O oh Buddha, the enlightened one, help me to set my heart bright. May my actions reflect your love and compassion. I shall remember to practice the Dharma in good or in the bad times. If I were to leave the world today, I would live as a better person than when I came into it. Whatever wrong someone has done to me, may I have compassion in my heart to forgive. I would also remember to be grateful for whatever help, support that I receive. To those I love and those who love me, May this life be a blessing and a gift to all of us. May us continue to practice the Dharma together. Namo Buddhaya. Thank you, Sister Mian.